Thanks very much indeed for that introduction. So what I'm going to talk about for the next 20 minutes is the power of the crowd and also the power of technology itself to really transform people's lives, particularly people with a disability like myself. Does that come up on the screen, all right? Yeah. Okay. Which side's the that side? Oops. Which side's the monitor? Is I mean, that way. Okay. Because I always have a habit of looking over my shoulder when I'm, and if I'm looking the wrong way, then uh, look like a bit of an idiot. So, um, I'll start off with a couple of slides, and then we'll get into more, some more practical demonstrations and that sort of thing. So, only a couple of slides to begin with. Slide two. The edge of the small screen. Three. I'm using a speech output here, so I don't know if you can hear this um, computer talking to me, a nice lady voice. Um, when there's some audio, I'll plug in the uh, external line, and then you guys can uh, get the audio on the videos and things, etc. So, the crowd is using mobile, as I'm sure you have no um, doubt at all uh, about. Um, the world is mobile. It's a mobile-first world, and it's really, really important that when you're thinking about anything that you're creating, um, Anything that's going to be online, anything that's going to be on uh, you know, an app, for example, you do it in an inclusive way. And this is because what used to be for people like myself, accessibility was for the disabled people, for that extra 20% that, that don't have 20-20 vision like this lady here. Um, now it's completely mainstream. And that's because basically mobile computing is extreme computing. You know, before it was just a normal big screen. If you couldn't see it quite so well, you'd get a bigger screen. Uh, if the sun was coming in through the window, you'd close the curtains or put the blind down in the office, whatever it might be. Um, if you're having trouble using your keyboard, you'd get a different keyboard or whatever it might be. Very, very different these days. And because of these extreme circumstances, you know, in this case, we've got somebody who is squinting at the screen. It might be a bright, sunny day. The app or the website that they're looking at might not have a good default font size or a really poor choice of font, a serif font, for example, or the color contrast might not be sufficient so that on a sunny day with the glare on the screen, it's really difficult to see. Or it might just be that, you know, she has, she's got her reading glasses or something like that. And so if you can increase the UX, the usability for those people, you're going to benefit people with a vision impairment, with dyslexia, etc., who may even not be looking at it on a small screen. There's so much overlap between um, accessibility requirements and uh, what everybody else requires in this sort of mobile first age. Here's another quick example of somebody. He's using a phone in one hand, he's got a cup of coffee in the other. How many people have used their phones one handed today? <laughs> you know, you might have been on the tube holding the strap, you might have been in the bathroom, I don't know. Um, so there's lots of times when we'll be using our mobile phones one handed. This chap's got a cup of coffee in his hand. And for that period, you are, to all intents and purposes, motor impaired. You know, it's, you're juggling with it, you're half dropping it. Um, to have good separation between touch points, you know, the different clickable areas on the screen is vital. Um, to not have things that are, you know, function critical next to each other where you might hit the wrong one by mistake, etc. And for somebody with a motor difficulty, dexterity problems, they would benefit from those exact same UX requirements. So it's really, really important. There is no longer this idea about accessibility being for people with a distinct disability or disability with a capital D. We've completely moved away from that now. Now this person's got a cup of coffee, so maybe he's on his coffee break. Maybe he's using, maybe he's using his phone to um, you know, fire up a website or an app and to buy something or to book a holiday or whatever it might be. And he's got a very limited time because he's in his coffee break. Maybe he's got 90 seconds to complete the transaction. That extreme usability that means that you can do something from start to finish in 90 seconds successfully on a small piece of glass with a cup of coffee in the other hand is what somebody with a learning disability or difficulty needs regardless of how long they've got or what the device is. So that extreme UX for people with learning difficulties will also help people that are trying to do something in a time critical way. So there is so many overlaps here. I hope you're kind of getting the picture. <clears throat> I desperately tried to find a picture of somebody with huge sausage fingers, like abnormally <laughs> large digits, but I couldn't find one. So um, here we've got somebody who's using a smallish phone. We're not all using you know, massive phones the, uh, quite yet. And um, if you have got big fingers, so just imagine that this person's got, you know, huge fingers. Um, some of you might have big, big fingers. Um, exactly the same scenario. 
Okay, they might not be juggling their phone one-handed, but their big fingers mean that separation of those touch spots um, is incredibly important for someone like that. Ooh. We don't all have jumbo phones yet with us. We don't all have jumbo phones yet, but some of us do have jumbo. Slide five. Cars and mobiles don't mix. So. Here I've got a picture of somebody in a car and their mobile phone screen is blank. And what I'm trying to represent here is that if you're in a car and you're using, you're interacting with your phone, you might be setting up a sat-nav so that you can use that while you're going along. You're basically going to interact with that app before you get driving. And hopefully you're not going to be doing too much interaction with your mobile device as you're driving along um, because it's illegal. And um, so to all intents and purposes, just imagine that if in that situation... Um, the screen is blank. You know, there is, there is literally no UI there to distract the driver. So what would that mean for your particular content or functionality? Well, um, obviously it's quite an extreme use case, but there are so many apps that interact in a different way. So Waze, for example, that popular sat-nav app, um, you can just wave at it um, and to, to be able to report something. And when that uh, menu comes up on the screen, you can voice, you can verbalize, whether it's you know, a speed camera or roadkill or whatever it might be. So there's some very um, innovative ways of interacting. And for people who have a very different way of interacting with apps in, in general, like Professor Stephen Hawking, as we'll see in a moment, then having these, uh, these options, these different redundancies, alternative choices of input and output methodologies are incredibly empowering for them. For me, anything that isn't speech friendly, that hasn't got properly labeled controls or links or images, is going to be very difficult for me to use because obviously I need to have those spoken out. It's exactly the same for people who would want to perhaps have their um, emails or text messages spoken out to them while they're driving along, for example. So, Smartphones have really revolutionized things for people with disabilities. Um, technology in general has been hugely empowering, but as soon as smartphones came along, all of that power was then available with you wherever you went. And not only that, you had all these other sensors. You had cameras, GPS, compass, um, accelerometer, and all of these things, some of which we'll, we'll look at a little bit later on, help to make that a much smarter, much more useful device for people with disabilities. And I use my smartphone and my smartwatch every single day to do a wide range of things, some of which we'll look at soon. But they were incredibly empowering and it's the potential for impacting people's lives for the better. I mean, now in the UK, 90% of jobs use a computer of some shape or form. And as so long as the uh, technology that they're using, the websites, the internal intranet systems, etc., have been done in an inclusive way, then people will be able to choose to have them spoken back, to speak to them, to control them with Dragon, for example, um, to just drive it from the keyboard instead of a, a pointing device, etc. Like Professor Stephen Hawking, for example, he is in effect a keyboard user. Um, and you might think, well, I know that my websites or my apps should be keyboard accessible, you should be able to tab through them and always see where the highlight is and always be able to activate that button or menu, etc. But there aren't that many keyboard users out there, are there? Well, there absolutely are. Everyone using a smart TV, there's no pointer on a smart TV browser or app interface. They are tabbing as, as they swipe or, or arrow through the UI elements in your app or, or um, website. They are, in effect, a keyboard user. Someone like Professor Hawking is, in effect, a keyboard user as he um, as his software scans through the different items on a web page or in an app. Uh, iOS, for example, is fully switch enabled, so Professor Hawking could use uh, a mobile phone, an iPhone, for example, and in effect tab through all the elements on a page and then click with his, um, he uses a, a switch on the side of his head, to um, start the scanning and then to select a particular object. So this technology is incredibly empowering and your clients, your customers, the crowd that's out there is going to be using them in so many different ways. I'm sure that you're getting the picture, but it's um, difficult to overemphasize the variety of um, use cases that are out there. And accessibility, although we don't want to call it that anymore, we want to call it inclusive design, um, those guidelines, that way of, of thinking and developing and designing is actually um, a, a sort of a, a sweet 
spot for how you can get to inclusive design if you, if you look at those guidelines and try and internalize how, what they're asking you to do. I just quickly close that. <clears throat> so now I am going to leverage the power of the cloud, you guys. Okay, so we're going to do a tiny bit of interactivity here. I'm just going to open up this. The LC me. Okay, I've just paused that. So uh, you can see capture a capture image up on the screen there. Zoom button. Zoom button. The volume up a bit. So how many of you have got a pen and paper? If you haven't, can you open your phone? to your notes application or whatever it might be, I'd like you guys just for the next minute to do something for me to be able to write down what you're about to hear. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and crack capture with the power of the crowd. Okay, so what you can see here is a typical kind of garbled image and that's because you all know about capture it's to prevent that it from being machine readable so bots can't submit that form can't complete that transaction etc and it's a, it's literally an accessibility catch 22 because as i mentioned before if people want choice in being able to um, decide what's best for them as far as input and output then it needs to be transferable into another format it needs to be machine readable which is obviously what capture isn't now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, captures, you know, we all know they're bad, and we're not going to use them ourselves. Think about this as being symbolic of what inaccessibility on the web looks like in all its shapes and forms, okay? So for me, um, the internet is filled with unlabeled images. It's filled with JavaScripted controls that I can't access. Um, for people with dyslexia, the website's filled with poorly chosen fonts or color contrast. Uh, I could go on and on, but I've only got 20 minutes and I'm probably going to overrun anyway, because I always do. So, um, but you get the idea. Think of this as being symbolic, as being illustrative of this larger problem of inaccessibility, and just bear with me if that's okay. So has everyone got something to write with? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, it's not going to be, what you're going to hear is not going to be the same as what you see on the screen, so sorry about that. So, I want you to write it down. It will repeat it twice, and bear in mind as you're writing this down, if you get one character wrong, no cigar, okay? And after that, we're going to compare it with the person sitting next to you, and we'll see if anyone's got the same. Okay, ready? How lovely. Okay, so 10 seconds. Please compare that with the person next to you. And I'll ask afterwards if anybody has got the same. Okay, so hands up, actually maybe that's not a good idea. Um, okay, let's do hands up and then somebody can tell me because you're all very inhibited, you know, we all, we're all very inhibited. Um, so yeah, anybody got the same as their colleague? Now that's no good, <laughs> absolutely. You've, you've spent five minutes, however, 10 minutes, filling out a whole bunch of screens worth of forms. Oh, you're on the very last one, you're on step five of five, you, you're confronted with a capture. Okay, now, the wheelchair symbol, which is an odd symbol for the audio version, but anyway, that's what it is. You've clicked on the wheelchair symbol because you've got dyslexia, you can't read the, audio, the visual capture, or you've got a vision impairment, or you can't see at all, and this is what you get. Okay, and this is it. This is what you have to contend with, and nobody got it right. And it's meant for us. It's meant for people, you know, to be able to understand that. Now, why is it garbled? Obviously, it's garbled so it can't be machine-readable. So voice recognition software can't do the biz on it, just like 
uh, optical recognition software can't do the biz on the visual version. So here we've got a version of Capture which is slightly more readable in as much as its actual words. Still, though, they're distorted enough that it's not machine readable. This is ReCapture, which is um, probably the most uh, friendly version, although what you heard a moment ago was the audio version of ReCapture. So um, now a lot of um, companies like Google are leveraging the source of the crowd, the power of the crowd, to, for example, digitize books, manuscripts. So for all I know, these two words here is, are served up to several people at the same time around the world. And if they all put in the same thing, then it accepts the capture. And at the same time, it takes those two words, or whatever it is, that phrase, and it adds it to the, it builds up digital versions of books. So they've scanned in these books, they've got software to chop them up into individual words, and then they piece them back together based on what people have put in. So that's really clever, but it still stinks. It absolutely stinks. Now for you guys, the internet, it's probably a nice place. It's a sexy place. It's, there's a lot of design, love, and affection gone into every website that you visit. It's an incredibly useful place. But now think about the essence of what your dismay was just then and, and apply that. And basically what you're doing is if you're not taking a bit of care to make sure that the things that you do are accessible and inclusive, you are going to be applying that dismay, that frustration, to all of your customers, not just the disabled ones who feel it most acutely on a daily basis, but all of those people who are temporarily disabled by their environment. You know, if you haven't got sufficient color contrast, if you haven't made it so that it's device independent, so that they can't you know, control it by voice or have it spoken out to them if they wish, then that level of dismay and disenfranchisement is what you're going to be subjecting your, your valuable clients to. I'm going to show you a quick app here because even though it's not machine readable, the power of the crowd is available to someone like myself. So I'm going to use an app called Be My Eyes here. Now it's in the App Store for both Android and iOS, I believe, certainly for iOS. It's free. You guys could download it now if you want to. And in fact, it might help. And I'll tell you why. Because what it does is it sources people. When you install it, it says, are you sighted? Do you want to be a helper? Or are you blind? Do you want to be a, a user? And if you click on being a helper, then you will be in that pool. And I'm going to fire up this app, and I'm going to click on the connect me to the next available helper, and they are going to be my eyes. I'm going to use the camera here, I'm going to point it at the screen, and I'm going to see if they can tell me what this visual capture is. And um, the only, there's two reasons why it might not work. One is because most of the helpers are in the States, and they're all asleep at this time. And the other is, um, I did this once uh, recently, and I accidentally kind of using the camera, pointed it at the audience and rather than just at the screen. And the person, I think, freaked out because they, they dropped the connection straight away. So we'll see. I'll just uh, fire it up. Open Be My Eyes. <coughs> so um, it might take too long for them to connect because they are mostly asleep in America. So we'll see. Um, but if it works, it'll work. Are you open? Okay. So, there's a big button. Connect to first available helper. Connect to first available helper. I'll do that, and we'll hear a little tune. Waiting for other part. Waiting for other part. Um, so, I think the music. It is still waiting. The music may come back in a moment, um, but hopefully we'll hear somebody come up and talk to us in a minute. Now. Capture is um, still out there. It's still an issue. There are various things that you can do to change uh, if you must use something that is you know, going to exclude the bots. In the next slide in a moment, we'll look at a couple of things that can help in that process. But um, I was speaking on Monday at, up in Manchester at the English Federation for Disability Sports. Oh, it's started. OK. So we've got the music back, but we haven't got anyone helping yet. Has anyone downloaded it? You could jump on. Right now. <laughs> um, and, uh, and on Monday, um, oh no, that's just a text come through. Um, in their, in their um, comments page, uh, they had a, a form online, and for the bots, it just said, what does the E stand for in EFDS? So um, it was a logic-based question, and that's certainly one of the ones that you can do um, in a sort of a low-level way to help. But as I say, I'll show you in a moment a couple of other more sort of um, pro-level alternatives. 
It's, no one's going to come. No one, no one's going to help. Should we leave it there? Have a look. If you, yeah, let's leave it there. If you download Be My Eyes, then you can be one of those helpers. Oh, it's still going. I've locked it and it's still going. Anyway, um, so if I go on to the next slide, what we've got here is a couple of examples. Now, I know that I said capture isn't, um, you know, it's just illustrative of the much bigger issue here. But while we're on the topic, so textcapture.com is a really important um, app, uh, API. It's an alternative and it just uses logic questions and uh, it's a robust API. It can take up to 2,000 calls a day free of charge. So unless you've got a very heavily trafficked form, then by all means use textcapture.com. And even though they're very simple logic questions like which of these four things is not an animal, you know, banana, dog, cat, mouse, um, the bots aren't able as yet to process those and um, be able to get around that capture image. And we can also see no capture, dot, uh, no capture here, which is a Google's version of it, which is great, but it doesn't work on mobile, unfortunately. So, you know, there's a definite flaw there. But a lot of people are using that uh, no capture service. But if you, if you have to use capture, then go for the logic version CSS question Google. version. So um, I'm just going <laughs> to get rid of this one somehow. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I think it's still going in the background. Okay, close be my eyes. So, um, we're now going to look at a quick um, video clip. So, we've talked about optical recognition not being up to cracking captures, but there's a huge amount of visual stuff on the internet. Um, you know, so many images, so many videos, and all of those are unindexable at the moment and are, for the vast majority, a no-go area for people like myself who need to have a text description of those. There is some very sophisticated technologies. Facebook is doing an awful lot to do automatic recognition. If anyone's got the Facebook app, um, it certainly works on iOS, I'm not sure about Android, uh, and you know how to fire up VoiceOver, which is the speech on your phone, go into Facebook fire up voiceover and tap on one of the images and you will see something equivalent to what we're about to see here, which is automatic recognition. It will say, picture may contain um, people, shoes, trees, that sort of thing. But this is a little bit more sophisticated. Unfortunately, it's not available as an app on anything under the Windows phone at the moment. But let's just see this in action. It's called Seeing AI by Microsoft. The LC Media. I'll just skip over the... Second shake. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well, or are they half asleep? Uh, I get that all the time, <laughs> particularly when I'm presenting. And you never know. I see two faces, 40-year-old man with a beard looking surprised, 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. I'll just pause it there. So I'm going to do this, you know. I'm going to only show you a bit of all the videos that I'm going to show very, very annoyingly, but that's so that we can get through a bit more. I'll tweet directly after I've um, finished talking. 
to using the hashtag CSWGlobal16, every link to apps and videos that I'm going to show you, I can send them to Etienne as well in case people want to get them by email. So that will kind of hopefully alleviate a little bit your annoyance for me not showing the whole of each of the videos. So sorry CSW, about that. So, five talking goggles. Um, I'm going to just quickly pull that out. So, unfortunately, I mean, I should get some of those pivot head glasses. They, they sound really cool, and then I'll be able to use that particular app. It's not available on the iPhone yet, but there is one called Talking Goggles. Now, all, um, with accessibility becoming mainstream, not just an issue for people with disabilities, as I mentioned before, similarly, we're able to use all of these mainstream devices that are now inclusive. They have all the accessibility we need built in. And not only that, we're able to do away with really expensive devices like talking sat-navs, talking um, barcode readers, stuff like that, and just get an app which is often free or cheap. And that's one I'm going to show you here, which is called Talking Goggles. And even though I can't use seeing AI that we saw a moment ago, this Talking Goggles is really good. It's almost as good. And it's free, or 99p, I think, if you don't want ads. And it's a mainstream product. It's aimed at everybody. And um, you know, have a look, see if you can download it. It um, has nicely accessible labeled buttons and controls. They've very, very thoughtfully added in a talking element. So as soon as it recognizes something that it, that it recognizes, it speaks it out. And because you've got GPS in your phone, and there's a lot of crowdsourced data around um, retail stores and even pricing and stuff like that, then what it's meant for is for all you guys to be able to whip out your phone, pick something off the shelf in the supermarket, it will recognize it, and if you tap on that, it will give you more information about serving instructions, stuff like that. But even if it's got the pricing data, and because it can tell where you are with the location on your phone, it can tell you where you can buy that item more cheaply around the corner. So it's meant for everybody, but as you'll see here, it's incredibly useful for people like myself who haven't got using you know, um, eyes that, that work, to have an eye that has some smarts behind it doing this object recognition that we saw a moment ago. So I'll just fire that up. App switcher, then cast, mail, setting, calendar, Dropbox. Maybe I haven't opened it. Open talking goggles. So what I'm going to do is I'll need a victim, I mean a volunteer, to... Um, to help me out here. So, Stop. can I have a volunteer? Yeah? Voice over off. So what I want you to do is I want you to hold it like that so that the back facing camera is facing the screen. And if you could just basically get that picture in the viewer. And just imagine that this is me walking along the street in Gay Paris. I often use it when I'm walking around in shopping centers. Oh, I think you just stopped. Did you just stop the record? Do you want me to? Yeah. There's a record. Oh. Well, probably I just touched the record. Should okay. I just take a picture? Don't touch. No. Oh, no. Pass it. That's all right. I'll just, can I? Okay. <laughs> just one second. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to put it on video mode. Oh, it is on video mode. Okay. Great. So don't touch the screen. Okay. Don't touch the screen. Okay. Just go like this. Okay. Go, go and stand in front okay. of it. Got that's it. all right. Just hold the edges. Great. Sorry about this. It's very prepared. Um, yeah. Just stand over there and kind of point it up at the screen. And it should say something. So I use this when I'm out and about to tell me whether I'm in front of Marks and Spencers or Poundland or something like that. It rec ability net. Oh, it got ability net there. Ability. Are you getting the picture in? Ability. Okay. Ability. Oh, try not to get the logo in then. <laughs> it should say. It should say iPhone. Yay! Okay, so try to just get the picture in. Sorry, this is very... I'm asking a lot, sorry. What about this one? No. What about this one? Just the picture if you can. No, just hold it, just point it at the screen. It should say... Not the logo. <laughs> Have you got the logo on the screen? Okay, it usually says Coca-Cola. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. So this is something I just took out of the cupboard. Weetabix, pack of organic 12x36 or whatever it said. Very good, one more. Is that okay? One more. I know this is painful, sorry. So it can recognize all these kind of objects, but it can also do OCR. It can do optical character recognition. So this text doesn't exist on the internet. This is just text. 
So if you just hold it up there. Still. It can recognize. It did kind of do it. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Very much. Cool. Thank you so much. So, yeah, it, um, it can do text, OCR, it can do object. Thank you so much. It can do object recognition. And I find that invaluable for mobility. When I'm out and about, I can tell which shop front I'm in front of, whether there's an open or closed sign on the door. If there's um, street signs that I can't read, if I'm a bit disoriented because my sat-nav hasn't picked up enough satellites, then I can read the street sign with it. When I'm at home, I can take CDs or, or uh, DVDs off the shelves, etc., etc. So incredibly empowering. Now, for mobility, that's incredibly useful. And a lot of apps like Blind Square, for example, which is an, a specialist app for blind people, sources a lot of information from the crowd. So um, Square, you all know Square, where you can be the mayor of your local Starbucks or something, um, gathers a lot of crowd-sourced POI information, points of interest information. And it has a really you know, rich database of that. And Blind Square uses that because, like any good crowd project, it has an open API that allows people to access that information. So Blind Square provides all the information about streets and everything from OpenStreetMap um, API, but it also provides lots of POI information, which is incredibly useful for a blind person to know which shop they're passing at any given time, etc. Um, but again, my, this is a Microsoft um, project that I'm going to show you. has gone that little bit further. And how many people are excited about VR? Yay. <laughs> VR is fantastic. And if it's done with a, most, with a powerful enough um, computer, then you don't get sick. Because at the moment, most people get sick because of the lag. You get hugely seasick within about 30 seconds. But if, if it's powerful enough and there's no lag, then you're totally immersed. The one thing that they haven't done yet, though, is audio immersion. So as you move your head around in that environment, if there are things that are making noise in that world, they don't pan with you. But this project by Microsoft, which is aimed at blind people, again has a huge overlap because it creates a 3D soundscape. As I'm walking along a street, it will speak things from the orientation where they are, and as I turn my head, um, it will pan that as well. So there's a huge overlap there, and these are all feeding into each other. So I'll skip over the, the credits at the beginning, and we'll just get a little blast of this. The impaired people, everyone is an individual, so to talk about the challenges and the barriers that they face when getting out and about on, on their own terms is difficult because every person is unique. True independence is to change somebody's perception, to allow somebody to say, on this day, I will go beyond what I know. A lot of it for me was inspired from when, I, when my daughter was born and I wanted to go and take her out for a day. She's four years old and, you know, we wanted to go to the Angel Cinema. How can I make that something that I will not hesitate to do? Windsor Castle, about five kilometers. At one level, when you look at the technology, it's just, it's plastic, bits of metal. But when you bring the components of mobile devices and, for example, the headset that we're uh, working on to deliver an experience, then all of a sudden what that technology enables a person to do is, 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 is something amazing. So you slip it over your ears as you would a standard set of headphones, but rather than covering your ears, it just touches your jaw bones. And it transmits just through vibration into your jaw bones sound, which sounds like it comes from outside of your head. If a uh, person is walking in a particular direction and over to the right of them, there's a, a coffee shop. Then that coffee shop actually is read out to them from, from the right-hand side, and it appears as if it's read out outside of their head, so it's not coming from the, the speakers that they're wearing. Continue for about 75 meters to Whitleywood Road. I would describe the process of almost painting with sound, painting with words, with an element of navigation as being the experience that you get when you slip on the headset, and then you begin to experience the route. The bus is due in three minutes. I got a lot of feedback on the routes that were coming up in terms of where I needed to turn left and right. It gave me information about where the uh, bus stops were along my routes and different things. It actually helped me create a bigger picture of, of the area that I was in, so it was fantastic. 
It is revolutionary what is happening here with sound. It has never been done before to create a 3D soundscape of the world around you when we are so used to using our vision. I'll just pause it there. So there's so many different areas here. There's, there's image recognition, there's voice recognition to be able to fire up your apps using Siri, for example, or dictate emails. There's text recognition. Um, I mentioned Facebook earlier. Other ones like Google are doing a lot of image, um, automatic image processing when you upload your, video, uh, your um, photos to, to Google so that you can search on particular people's faces, etc. Apple are doing a similar thing. Last week, Twitter announced that they're allowing people to add alternative text to images. And obviously, while that's, that's not as kind of sexy as an automatic image recognition, hopefully it'll be a lot more... Um, reliable, a lot more accurate, when people are actually creating those alternative texts. And if Twitter are clever, they'll use that as an opportunity to crowdsource um, machine learning into a process that will allow them to build a really clever in image processing, image recognition engine, because people are going to be feeding in all of these alternative texts into images that they can then compare with those descriptions and hopefully create something that's just as powerful, or if not more so, than what we've been seeing earlier. So all of these things are coming together, and I'm just going to finish off by taking a peek into the future. CSW, so, 7A trip down Market Street, dash San VLC media. Over there. So... This is the future. Zuma. Zuma. Okay, we're in the future now. I might just mute it so that... Actually, this isn't the future. This is 110 years ago in San Francisco uh, in 1906. And the reason why I'm showing this is because we're on the verge of autonomous vehicles and everyone's really excited about them, me too very, very excited about autonomous vehicles. I had a chap who came to a meeting the other day in a Tesla, and he literally didn't drive on the motorway. It had Lane Keeper and this clever cruise control, which um, was watching out all the cars around them and that sort of thing. And he basically just had his hand on the steering wheel because that's a legal requirement. But for the 70 miles on the motorway, he did nothing. Absolutely nothing. The technology is here, and it's going to be very, very... Um, the government announced last month that they are going to do legal road tests on the streets of Britain, so probably outside in some streets in London there are going to be autonomous vehicles being tested. And the insurance companies in particular are very excited about this because they drive better than we do. And because they're gathering all this data, 750 gigs of data are being crunched every minute, they've got this perfect audit trail of whose fault it was you know, they'll be able to conclusively show that it was the other guy's fault. And because they drive more carefully than us mere mortals as well, there's going to be fewer crashes. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, I read a really interesting article recently of, um, about autonomous vehicles and what it's going to spell out for the future. And they said that it's really quite a new phenomenon to have cars going on lanes down the middle of a road and to have all these people segregated onto these small ribbons of concrete in front of the face of buildings where they have to all cram in and you know, jostle against each other. And when they want to cross to the other side of the street, they have to wait at these street lights that take a minute to change and all that sort of thing. So they thought that in the future, it's going to be a lot more like this, a lot more chaotic, but safer and more flexible. And the power of the crowd, I talked about Waze earlier, where people who are using that app are also gathering data. They're providing information about traffic uh, conditions, about accidents and that sort of thing. All these autonomous vehicles are going to be not only reporting to each other to avoid collisions, etc. it will be a no-brainer for that API to be open, to be able to talk to everyone else, including apps like that Cities Unlocked that we saw a moment ago that Microsoft are doing. So I'll know exactly where everyone is, and my speech in my ears will be able to tell me how to avoid people and how, when it's safe to cross the road and all this sort of thing. So perhaps it's a utopian vision, and perhaps something like this in 10 years' time, where only half of the vehicles are smart and the other half are humans-driven, is quite a scary prospect. But who knows? Maybe this idea of segregating... And there's a lot of shared surfaces now which actually are very difficult for people who are blind to navigate at the moment, might be the way things are going in the future. i just close that. CSW button. Eight out row. So just bringing up the last slide just to kind of finish off. So... Whatever the future has to hold, I hope that you share my optimism and excitement about what technology is going to hold for people, for everyone, but much more so for people who have 
more significant requirements than um, just the utility that technology brings and the opportunity for, for everyone. For me, it's been an absolute game changer. I was so lucky that back in the 80s, the personal computer came along just at the right time to help me with my education. I now work in technology, which, um, you know, that career wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this technology and if it wasn't accessible for me to be able to use and tell everybody about. Um, so, you know, still today, 73% of people in the UK with a vision impairment are out of work, which is criminal. They've got so much to offer. And the technology is there. It's just this awareness gap, this imagination gap that employers need to bridge. And hopefully seeing people, seeing disabled people use technology in a really powerful way will help them overcome that imagination gap. So I owe my education, I owe my work to technology. I live in Warwick, which is a nice part of the world. Come and see the castle, very nice. Um, and if I hadn't moved to Warwick, I wouldn't have met my wife and I wouldn't have my two gorgeous children. So I owe everything to the technology.